The next thing to look at, and an important thing to consider, is how digestible is the feed? Because really, if you're feeding it and the horse can't digest it, then there's probably not much point feeding it. Um, so a lot, of the, a lot of the feeds available are based on grain. Um, and we feed these grain and grain-based feeds to horses for calories. It's the only reason we feed them. Um, and most of the energy or the calories in grain is contained in starch. So if you've ever broken a piece of corn or a piece of barley or something open, you see the white stuff in the middle, that's the starch. And that's where most of the energy is. The problem is horses can't fully digest starch from uncooked or raw grains in the small intestine. So this is for, for three years I studied this when I was doing my PhD, um, looking at... at how much of the starch a horse eats from all these various different types of grains. So we looked at um, triticale and rice and corn and barley and um, a couple of other things and also a whole um, bunch of different processing methods and trying to measure how much starch they could actually digest. And for the raw stuff, they really didn't digest very much of it at all, maybe 25% of the starch. Um, so feeding raw grains to horses means that horses can't fully utilise their feed. So um, when you feed them, say, a, a cracked corn, um, which hopefully not many of you will, but thoroughbred trainers are still very renowned for feeding cracked corn. Um, if you feed them a cracked corn, they're only going to break down about 25% of the starch in their small intestine and absorb it as glucose, and the rest will go through and be fermented in the hindgut. So it does actually get digested via fermentation, but the problem with that, well, there's many problems with that, but one of the problems is that you actually lose 30% of the energy contained in that starch just as gas and heat and, and byproducts of fermentation. So it becomes a very, very inefficient way of feeding your grain because essentially you're taking 30% of it and just tipping it on the ground because the horse doesn't get any, any benefit from it. Um, and the other issue, and, and probably a bigger issue, is that when it travels into the hindgut, it'll ferment, and the bacteria that ferment the starch do it very, very rapidly and they produce a lot of volatile fatty acids and they produce lactic acid um, and it causes a condition known as hindgut acidosis. So the hindgut of a horse should remain in a really nice, neutral, stable pH and it shouldn't really change from um, about 7 to 7.5. As soon as you start fermenting grain in there, the pH of the hindgut drops quite quickly um, and it can, it can get down, I've measured it in, in um, racing horses, down as low as five and a half, which is really very acidic um, for a hindgut. And also your, your bacterial populations completely shift. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of focus on, in human health at the moment on how important our bacterial populations are for our health. It is exactly the same for horses. Um, and when you, when you start putting this raw cereal grain into a horse's hindgut, you actually start, there's... there's um, <coughs> two major families of, of bacteria in the hindgut. One family loves to ferment fibre and the other family loves to ferment starch. And the fibre fermenting ones are kind of slow and dopey and they reproduce very slowly. So they only reproduce roughly every 18 hours, which for a bacteria is really slow. Um, whereas the starch fermenting ones ferment everything really quickly and they reproduce every two hours. So they're quite aggressive um, for bacteria. If you feed them starch, they just completely take over the hindgut environment um, and once the pH drops, the poor little fibre fermenting bacteria don't like an acidic environment. So they actually start to, they'll shut down initially and just try and hide um, and survive. But then if the pH gets below about 6.2, they'll just start to die. Um, and you will literally kill them all. And you, you can smell, um, if you've ever walked into a horse's stable, and, you, and particularly in racing stables, you can smell their manure and it smells like vomit. Has anyone ever smelled that? like that really acidic. So if you can smell that, that horse has got acidosis and there'll be a whole bunch of um, stuff going on inside that gut that you can't see. And unfortunately, the horses um, look okay for a fair while, even though they've got a really acidic hindgut. It would be better um, for us as nutritionists, it would actually be better if the horse just went down in a heap when it got hindgut acidosis because then people would realise that what they're doing and what they're feeding is actually not doing the horse any favours. Um, but the horses will keep racing and keep eating to some extent, but um, the acidosis, it'll cause laminitis. Um, the, the gut will start leaking, so stuff that should never get out of the gut will actually start leaking out into the blood because the, um, the wall of the gut gets quite abraded. Um, they'll, it'll cause um, loss of appetite because when a horse has got acidosis, it actually becomes B1 deficient because there's no nice fibre fermenting bacteria in there producing B vitamins anymore. And there's also stuff produced by the starch fermenting bacteria that kills vitamin B1. 
just destroys it. Um, so they become quite B1 deficient. They become biotin deficient. So I'm sure you've all heard the the um, thing where um, people say, oh, thoroughbreds have got terrible feet. And you've probably all had, who's had a thoroughbred that has got terrible feet? Um, thoroughbreds don't have terrible feet. When you see them as babies on stud farms, they've got beautiful feet. They've got completely normal horse feet. Um, and they don't just fall apart. Um, but when they go into racing stables and they're fed a lot of raw grain and they get all their bacterial populations messed up in their hind gut and they get all their biotin production messed up, their feet are terrible. So they do have terrible feet, but it's not because of their breed, it's because of the way that they're fed. Um, it's just an interesting, interesting point. So the solution to avoiding all of these issues that you get with raw grains is to cook the grain um, and make the grain easy to, to digest. And we found in my studies, and, and it's been um, people before me had found the same thing, and people since me have found the same thing, is that the most effective way to cook cereal grains for horses is via extrusion. And extrusion is essentially pressure cooking a grain. So you, you heat it um, to quite a high temperature and you put um, moisture in there under pressure um, and, that, and that's how the grain is cooked. So um, this is just a visual thing on why we extrude grains. So this is a, a piece of barley that's been cut, like if you imagine the grain like this and you cut it through the middle and then turn it around and look at it front on. Um, the, the bit up the top, let's see if this pointer works. Working? Yeah, it's hard to see. The bit up here is the seed coat. So that's the brown thing on the outside. When you look at the barley grain, you can see it. Directly under the feed, the seed coat is a layer called the alirone layer. Um, so the green stuff is, is protein. So anything staying green is protein, which makes it look like it must be a really high protein grain. It's not really. It's just that it looks like there's a lot of protein. Um, and then this bit in here, so underneath the alirone layer, um, is the starchy endosperm. So that's the white bit you will see in the middle of a grain. Inside the starchy endosperm, there's all these endosperm cells. So I've got one um, drawn around there and you can see all the other little cell walls here. That's the endosperm cells. And then the, the black thing sitting inside the endosperm cells are the starch granules. So that's the, that's the stuff that the horse needs to get to to get the calories out of the grain. And the starch, remember I was saying that starch is just a long chain of glucose molecules and some of them are straight like this, some of them are, are branched, um, but it's just all glucose joined together. It's not sitting around in the grain like this. It's actually bundled up into this tiny little tight bundle. Um, if we have a look at the next oops, slide, um, this is now the inside of an endosperm cell, massively magnified. So the, the big blobs you can see are the starch granules and then the tiny little blobs around it are all protein. Um, and the problem for a horse's enzymes in the small intestine is they need to get through the seed coat and the alirone layer, which hopefully if a horse has chewed the grain up to a decent extent, it will get through those bits. Um, but even if it does get through the... The little um, enzymes get to get through the endosperm cell wall, which is no mean feat when you have no way of breaking down the cell wall because you're not a pair of scissors to chop up fibre, you're a pair of scissors to chop up starch, so they can't actually get in unless there's an opening. And then even if they do get through the endosperm cell wall, they've got to somehow make their way through all this protein, which again, they're not a pair of scissors to chop up protein, um, they're a pair of scissors to chop up starch. So if they, there's no easy way to get to the starch granule, they just can't get through there. And then... Um, the cruelest twist of fate, I think, is that even if they make it to a starch granule, the starch granule looks like this. Um, and it's actually quite difficult for the enzymes to get in. Like if I um, gave that to you and said chop some glucose off there, it's actually quite hard to get in and chop single little pieces of glucose off there because it's all wrapped up in this little ball. Um, so they, this is why they can only digest about 25% of the starch that's in grain because there's so many physical barriers to digestion. So what we need to do when we cook grains is actually remove all of those barriers to digestion. So um, when grains are extruded, the grains are completely ground up before they go through the extruder. So that's gotten rid of the seed coat and the alirone layer and it will have destroyed some of the cell walls and some of the protein structures. Um, but they've found that even if you grind corn really, really, really finely, you still only increase starch digestion by a couple of percent. So it's not that that's stopping um, the starch digestion process. It's the fact that when the enzymes get to the starch, it's bundled up in these tiny little balls. So what extrusion does is um, the water actually gets in and, um, in combination with the heat and it actually disrupts that, that starch granule structure. So instead of being a really tightly bundled little ball, it actually opens up and looks much um, 
looser and easy to chop up. So if I gave you that now in a pair of scissors, you'd chop it to pieces because it's, it's so easy to chop up because the structure is so much more open. So um, part, of, part of what my um, research did was actually develop this um, assay that we could do in a lab that showed us how digestible um, a grain was in the small intestine of a horse without actually having to put it in the small intestine of a horse. Because once you put grain into the small intestine, it's very hard to get it back out again. Um, without it going through the hindgut first. So we needed an easy way of comparing, comparing grains. So, so all we did was um, get a test tube and we would put inside the test tube some um, very finely ground up grains. So in this case, we were comparing uncooked corn with micronized corn with extruded corn. And then into there, we would put fluid that was similar to the um, similar pH um, and similar to the fluid that's in the small intestine. And then we put the little enzymes in. So we'd put all the little pairs of scissors in there. Um, and we would know exactly how much starch we'd put into each of those test tubes. So we'd, we would know um, how much starch we started with and then you'd incubate it at the horse's body temperature for 15 minutes being stirred around and then we'd measure how much glucose we had at the end. So essentially all we were looking at was how much of this was chopped up into glucose. So in 15 minutes uncooked corn we could get about 15% of the starch converted into glucose. So virtually nothing. Um, most of it left in, that, in those test tubes was still starch, not glucose. Micronized corn, um, we're getting about 35% of it broken down, so it was better, but it wasn't great. Um, and then the extruded corn that we were using, there was about 75% of it was, was broken down from starch into glucose in the 15 minutes. So there's a huge difference between processing methods. Um, and the extruded stuff, because of the, the heat and the pressure that's used and the amount of moisture that's used, um, the starch structure really does open up a lot and it becomes very, very easy for the horse's enzymes to, to chop up. Uh, this was a, um, we looked at a, a whole bunch of grains. It was for a company in um, New Zealand that wanted to just compare the digestibility of a whole heap of grains. So this was only done a couple of years ago. Um, and I went and just collected grains from feed stores. So the companies that were making these grains didn't know that we were collecting the grains because we didn't want them to um, you know, give us special batches that they'd processed in a special way to make them look better than they might have been. Um, but basically, they're just ranked in um, digestibility. So and again, this is exactly the same little assay and the percent, it's showing you the percent of starch that's digested in 15 minutes. Um, and by digested, we mean it's broken down into glucose. So um, no real surprises down here. Raw maize and raw barley. There's only, um, you know, just over 20% of the barley was broken down. The barley starch was broken down into glucose. This one's interesting. Steam rolled barley. Does anyone use steam rolled barley? No. So the, the problem with steam rolling is if it's done properly, so if the grain is actually steamed for um, enough time and the starch actually gets properly cooked, it is amazing stuff. We had, we had a steam rolled grain um, when I was doing my PhD and it was almost as digestible as an extruded grain, so it was really, really well steam, steam rolled. The problem with most of the steam rolled barley in Australia is that the steaming, the grains get steamed, but they get steamed for like 20 seconds. Um, so that there's not enough time. Like you can't put rice in a pot and cook it for 20 seconds and expect it to be cooked. It just doesn't happen. So you don't get much of an improvement in starch digestibility when you only steam something for a very, very short period of time. So, um, I mean, yes, it's been steamed and it's been rolled, but it hasn't been steamed and, um, for nearly long enough to actually influence starch digestibility. So it's just a bit of a beware if you're buying steamrolled grains. There is a couple of people in Australia that do a really good job of steam steamrolling. Um, and whether if you ask the question whether they will say to you, yes, we steam our grains for five minutes before they're rolled or no, we only steam them for 20 seconds before they're rolled, they probably wouldn't tell you. Um, but most steam, ro steam rolled grains that I've looked at um, aren't very digestible just for the simple fact that they're not steamed for very long. Raw oats are sitting down here and oats is an interesting one. Um, these, all these assays are done with bacterial enzymes because it's really hard to get horse enzymes. Um, so we have to do them with bacterial enzymes. But one of the things I did when I was studying was go, well, we think that these assays are ranking grains on digestibility for horses, but how do we know that they're the same, like doing the same job, the bacterial enzymes are doing the same job as a horse enzyme? So we had a, a couple of horses that had to be euthanized for various reasons. And, and we actually went and collected their small intestinal contents. We just had their natural enzymes in them and then we used those um, small intestinal contents, we measured the enzyme levels 
because you can you can test and see how much enzyme there is in there. And then we actually use those enzymes to, to do the same assay in the lab. And what we found was really interesting was that the, the horse's enzymes broke down oats much more efficiently, or the starch from oats much more efficiently than the bacterial enzymes could. So there's something there's something about oats and horses. They just go together. Um, they can digest the starch. So oats don't need to be processed. You'll get better starch digestibility if they are cooked, um, but they don't need to be cooked. The horse will be able to digest a lot more of the starch from a raw oat than it will be from a raw barley or a raw corn. So even though it's sitting down here, the raw oats, probably the likelihood is that it should be um, quite a bit higher. But you can see, um, so there's steamrolled oats here. You can see that, that there was a bit of a benefit of um, actually applying some heat and moisture to that. Um, micronized barley, interestingly, wasn't much better than the raw barley, so it's only sitting at just under 30% of the starch broken down. Micronized maize was better. I don't know why, um, and this is part of the problem with micronization is there's a lot of variability depending on who's doing the cooking, how fast they do it, what the moisture level in the grain was before they cooked it. Um, and then... As we've always found, and everyone always finds, the extruded grains are sitting right up that end um, with, with better digestibility. So the, the corn there is um, just over 60%, and then the, the barley was just over 70% of the starch broken down in 15 minutes. Um, and the nice thing about extrusion is you can't cheat with an extruder. Um, so you can cheat with a steamroller in that you might only steam it for five seconds as opposed to five minutes. Um, or, and you can cheat with a micronizer, you just turn up the speed of how fast the grain is traveling through the micronizer. Um, you can't cheat with an extruder. So it doesn't matter who is doing the extruding, which company, um, if it's extruded, it will be digestible. Because if you try and turn up the speed of an extruder, it just comes out as a blob at the end um, and it, it won't stick together and you can't make a, a proper feed out of it and it looks terrible. So you just, that, that has to be cooked at the right temperature and at the right moisture and for the right amount of time because otherwise it just doesn't work. So extruded grains tend to be very consistent in their level of digestibility, whereas a lot of your other processing methods will change around.